Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape. Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. living in a new and fabulous land, surrounded by all that is generous and kind, while your hosts, heedless of your pleas, are planning, as is the custom of their country, to kill you in a strange and terrible manner. Listen now as Escape brings you the fantastic story of The Voyages of Sinbad. It is related that there lived in Baghdad a poor man called Sinbad the Porter, who earned his living carrying loads upon his back and head. One day, as he was sweating and staggering in the great heat, he passed the door of a house which to him seemed to belong to a rich merchant. Wearily, Sinbad the Porter set his load on the ground and sank onto a bench near the door. He marveled the scented air and the sounds of birds from within the gardens. And after a few minutes, the door opened and a slave came toward him and bade the porter follow. And they went in and entered a great hall. Welcome. Be at your ease. Will you allow me to ask your name and your trade? Oh, master, I am called Sinbad the porter and I carry heavy loads for light payment. Porter... Your name is the same as mine, for I am called Sinbad the Sailor. I requested you to come here, for I saw you sitting outside my door, and your weariness and misery touched me. Oh, Master, in the name of Allah, do not blame me for my grief. There is no need to be ashamed. There's no shame in poverty. When you have heard all my adventures, you will understand what trials I have had to undergo to purchase the wealth you see about you with strange and terrible labors, with calamities and misfortunes which are hardly credible. Seat yourself by my side, partake of the food and wine you see about you, and I shall relate to you my extraordinary voyages. And then perhaps you will have more faith in your own destiny, which, unknown to you, has been written, and as it is written, must inevitably come to pass. You must know, O oh Honorable Porter, who bears the same name as myself, that upon the death of my father, I found myself possessed of a considerable fortune which I spent in the accustomed excesses of youth. And when I found that my purse was nearly empty, I determined to travel. And going to the market, bought myself a lading of varied merchandise which was carried on board a ship just starting from Baghdad with other merchants. We made excellent time across the seas, trading to great profit from island to island, until one day, in mid-ocean, a tempest came upon us and the great seas broke our ship to pieces and washed all who were aboard into the gulfs of the water. Thanks to Allah, I found a plank and clinging to it for several days, found myself thrown more dead than alive upon the beach of an island. Undoubtedly, he is a stranger to our land. See how he dresses? He is from some unfortunate ship that has foundered beyond. Allah have mercy on his soul. Uh, oh. He is alive. Uh, oh, stranger, we thought you dead and were about to carry your body for burial. Water. Water. I shall die if I do not have water. Quickly, carry him to the house. And this they did and offered me food and water. Until having recovered, I was taken to be presented to the king, who received me with great joy, for I was a stranger, 
and it was the custom to behave in that fashion. And he said, Sinbad, your escape has been a miraculous and wonderful story. Never more shall you want for that which you have lost. I have instructed the Grand Wazir to give you a sum of money and presents of your choosing. I thanked the king, and because in his court I had seen a woman both noble and beautiful with whom upon sight I had grown to love, I begged for her hand in marriage. This gift he granted me, and gave us a palace with servants and a following which was truly royal. I lived in the calmness of supreme joy for many months. And then I nourished the hope that I could leave the city and return to Baghdad. Here then was the beginning of the dreadful event which overtook me. I returned to my wife after presenting my plea to the king. And in my heart was a foreboding heavy and evil. Oh, Sinbad, my treasure of treasures. What has befallen that you should show such unhappiness? I spoke to the king within the hour. And is this reason for tears? And more. I have not spoken of it to you, my love, but of late I cherish the hope that we might return to my homeland, to Baghdad. I long for it. Both day and night, it never leaves me. I spoke of this desire to the king, and he turned a deaf ear. Oh, you should have spoken of this to me before you went to the king. Perhaps you have angered him. No, but... Oh, I know. I know. It is the custom... You are now a citizen of the land. No citizen may leave it. Ah, but be of good cheer, my treasure. Here we may live out our lives fruitfully and in great joy. Come, I have a red bird to show you. He was caught only this morning. But I could not rid my mind of the fears which grew one upon the other. I was virtually a prisoner in the land. And then one day, my neighbor's wife died, and as he was my friend, I went to him and tried to console him. It is Allah's will, and I shall perish for it. Do not grieve more than is lawful, O oh my neighbor. Soon the agony will become softer, and Allah will find you another wife. May he prolong your days, my friend. How can you say that? Why, it is the truth. How can you wish me a long life when you know that I have but one hour to live? One hour? Why do you speak in that way? What gloomy presentiments are these? Surely you would not think of killing yourself. Is it possible that you do not know the customs of our country? I am confused, oh, my friend. What custom is this? It is a rule here, a law, that every husband must be buried alive with his dead wife and every wife buried alive with her dead husband. But this cannot be. In one hour's time, I shall be committed to the earth with the body of my wife. As Allah lives, the custom is detestable. You must refuse. The very thought of such a thing is It to... is the custom. Every man must conform to the custom of our ancestors. Now I bid you farewell, for I must prepare myself for what is to come. And as I stood in his house, the friends and relations of my neighbor gathered, formed a procession, and the funeral went forward. The woman's body was placed in an open casket, dressed in her most beautiful garments and wearing the chief of her jewels. And the husband walked beside the coffin. We all proceeded with slow steps towards the place of burial. Now the man, Abdul, who had befriended me at the shore, explained what was to happen. There, Sinbad, where the stone cover is being lifted, it covers a well of great depth. That is where they lower the body? Yes, and afterwards the husband will be put in. But he will surely die. Is there no escape? None. A large jar of water and seven loaves will go with him. Then the stone cover will be replaced. As it is written, so must it be. Look, he suffers this to be done with no complaint. It would be useless. Slowly, my neighbor was lowered into the well. And then, as Abdul had spoken, the stone cover was replaced. And we all returned whence we had come. I was sick with fear at what I had seen. In all my travels, never had I witnessed so barbarous a custom. And though my love for my wife was great, my fear was greater. The only consolation I could find was in the thought that I should be the first to die. And therefore, I would not suffer the burial alive. But this consolation was vain. For a short time afterwards, my wife fell ill of a strange malady. 
You will be well again. Oh, my love. No. No, never again. I am so weak. The day becomes his night. My love, my treasure, do not speak in this way. I have sent for the highest physicians in the land. They will bring ointments with which to cure you. My jewel, you must live. You must. Where are you? Sinbad. Sinbad. She lingered on for a little time, and then, in spite of all the cares I could give, she died. My grief and horror knew no bounds, and I had no doubt as to my fate when the king came to visit me and consoled me over my approaching end. Oh, Sinbad, I grieve for you, as do your true friends. Master, my eyes have overflowed with weeping until they have become dry. There is nothing left for me but to beg at least for my own life. Oh, this cannot be. But I am a stranger. It is not just that I should have to suffer by your law. It is not my loss. The loss of my wife sufficient agony to bear. My poor friend, it is the custom, the law. But I shall walk beside you in the procession and weep with you, for I am exceedingly fond of you, Sinbad. <laughs> And so it was done. We came to the well beside the mountain which overlooked the sea, and my dear wife's body was lowered into it. And then, in spite of my struggles and lamentations, ropes were fixed under my arms, and tying a jar of water and seven loaves of bread to my back, they began to lower me into the well. Farewell. Oh, Silbert, farewell. No. No, I do not deserve this. I cannot die like this. No! Their voices came from a greater and greater distance, echoing the mournful wail about me until the sounds became lost in the blackness. Down, then deeper was I lowered, and then I reached the bottom. The rope end was released from above, and I saw the light of the opening disappear as they replaced the great stone cover and went their ways. I was alone in that fearful underground place, alone with only the dead for my companions. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, smart young ladies over 18 who are style conscious and love their country will find that they look first rate in the uniform of the United States Army or Air Force. Ask at your nearest recruiting office and find out which of the many fascinating openings fits you best. Enlist and serve with honor. Defense is everybody's job. And now, back to escape. I stood for long moments after the stone cover had been replaced over the well. And then my eyes became accustomed to the semi-darkness and I took note of this mortuary cave which I found to be strewn with old and new bodies. It filled me with indescribable horror. But being determined not to die out of hand, I made careful inspection of the cave. It was very high and stretched further than the eye could reach and I noticed that many precious jewels and ornaments of gold and silver rested in countless numbers upon the ground. These, I realized, were the useless possessions of the dead. For two or three days I lived thus, ever searching for a way out, until I heard the stone cover of the wall being removed and a woman's body was lowered in its coffin. She, in turn, was followed by her mortal husband. I heard his cries of fear as he descended. And as with myself, the rope hurtled down after him and the stone cover was replaced. At first he did not see me, and I saw that he was a huge and powerful man. 
He fell to the ground and beat himself in the face and stomach with his fists. Hear me, your friend. Who? Who is there? Answer me for the love of Allah. Who is it? I, I cannot see you. Who are you? Do not come nearer. Be in peace, so, my friend. I am but Sinbad the sailor who was put into this place but a few short days ago. You are human. You are alive, but I thought all who came here died. The bread and water gives us nourishment for a little while. In that time, we may seek an escape. There is no escape. It is Allah's will. I curse the woman I married that she should bring me to such an end. No. Speak gently of her, friend. It is more the fault of yourself than hers. You should have seen to it in life that this horrible thing, this law, would be abolished. It is the custom. No man can stop it. It is the custom. <laughs> With these words, he covered his head with his arms and rocked to and fro, weeping and crying out against his destiny and his departed wife. I withdrew for him. For it suddenly came to me that in this brute I would have much to fear. I had eaten and drunk sparingly, but my wants were little when compared with the girth of the stranger. And therefore I hid my remaining food and water and resolved to use them only in a most secret manner. But after the passing of two days, I knew that my companion had eaten his seven loaves with huge appetite and was watching me to discover the hiding place of my own stores. We are brothers, O oh Sinbad. Give me but a slice of your bread, else I must starve. Well, there is but enough left for myself to give to you will hasten my death as well as your own. Then tell me where you have concealed it that I may better imagine the taste of bread and water, even though I may not share it with you. <laughs> And then, in an unguarded moment, he discovered the place where I had concealed my poor scraps and dregs of water. With a mighty lunge, he tore all from me, and like a wild beast began to devour the food. Wait! You leave nothing for me! Oh, what fool are you, then? But live in peace with the knowledge that I did not have to wring it from you. I saw then that I should have to kill this man at the earliest moment. For in his eyes I perceived a madness that would mean a more dreadful death for me than starvation. I left him then and went to search for a weapon with which to defend myself. And amongst the finery and wealth upon the ground, I found a jeweled dagger. And this I hid in my clothes and determined to use when the man again felt the pangs of hunger. Oh, oh Sinbad. Oh, good friend, you may tell me. I promise upon my word that I shall share with you. There is more bread, more water. You have hidden it in another place. Give me but a scrap, a morsel, I beg you. There is no more. We must lie down and die. Oh, I know you have more. You do not suffer as I do. Tell me, for the love of Allah. There is no more. Oh, if another day passes, I shall die. Hear me, O oh Sinbad. Share with me your remaining food, and together we shall prolong our lives. I have no more. You devoured the last of it. You lie, you lie. I speak the truth. You lie. Hey, you... No. You... You're choking me. Stop. His hands tightened about my throat, and as I felt my senses departing, I summoned all my strength to withdraw my dagger from its place and plunged it into his body. With a great sigh, he fell away from me and to the ground where he died. And once more, I was alone with the dead. Three days and more passed. My food and water came to an end and I gave myself up to Allah's will. It was then that I heard a noise of living breath and a movement as of steps somewhere in the deeper recesses of the cave. A great hope grew in me, for here was another being like myself. And I saw a dark shape huddled against the wall. Who is it? Who? 
Who are you? Uh, oh, have mercy, oh, master. Mercy. I am old, old and frail. Have mercy. I did not see you lowered into the cave. Nay, I was not. I come from the outside. The outside? There is an escape from this place. Yes. Then why have you come here? In my wickedness, I seek the wealth of those who are fallen in here. I beg of you, do not kill me for it. I am old and weak, and the treasures can do the dead no good. Oh, I will not kill you, but you must lead me from this place. I would gladly, but my age is upon me. I'm too weak. I must rest. No! Now, now, for unless I reach food and drink, I shall surely die. But then, then perhaps, for I perceive that you are strong in limb, perhaps you would carry me, for my weight is but that of an autumn leaf. This will I do. Oh, good old man, climb upon my shoulders <laughs> and lead me the way from this accursed place. <laughs> And to my great joy, he did as I bade him. And after traveling countless passages, we came upon a hole which had been burrowed in the earth and thence into the open air. About me were trees bearing the most succulent of fruits and a silver stream was at my feet. I made to put the old man down to sate my hunger and thirst. <laughs> but he did not move. Rather, he pressed his thighs more tightly around my neck and weighed down upon my shoulders with all his weight. And a great fear took me. I tried to throw the old man to earth, but he replied by pressing my throat until I was half strangled. And then he kicked me in the stomach until I got up. Now, take me to the tree over there, for I am hungry. I desire to pluck the fruits upon it. Go! You're strangling me. Go! Then perhaps I shall allow you to feed as befits a beast of burden. Yes. All that day and night it stayed upon my shoulders and I was no better than a beast of burden. In the morning I was aroused by a great kick and urged on to find his breakfast with blows from his fists and feet. I had never suffered such humiliation of spirit or discomfort of body. I could find no way to rid myself of him, and I cursed the virtuous impulse which had led me to help him. Rather, I thought I should have remained in the cave to die in peace. And then one day, after weeks of servitude, I found a good. What is the purpose of that strange object lying before the tree over there? It is a good, old man. A good? What manner of thing is this? It has many uses. In my land, it is a receptacle for wine. Wine? You speak with strange words, Sinbad. What is wine? Wine? It has been long since I tasted of it, but it is a sensation so delicate that one's senses cannot encompass the pleasure brought about by its use. Oh, how, how is it made? With the grape. Then you must make me wine, Sinbad. Go pick up the gourd. And make me wine. And I saw in his command an idea. And I did as I was bidden. I squeezed the grapes of a prolific vine into the gourd and allowed it to ferment. And when the fermentation had ceased, he ordered me to taste of it, to test its quality. Well? Well, Sinbad? It is very fair, old man. And you drank it all yourself? <laughs> Give me the gourd, slave! <laughs> Whereupon he carried the wine to his lips and drank it to the last drop and threw the gourd far up among the trees. <laughs> Soon the wine began to work on his brain. First he danced and jigged on my shoulders and then half collapsed with slack muscles. With a rapid movement I threw the old man to the ground and then fell upon him and smashed his skull to pieces with a rock. And thus he died. May Allah have compassion upon his soul. I 
I made my way to the shore where destiny willed I should find a party of sailors who had disembarked from an anchored ship to hunt for water and fruit. On hearing my tale, they marveled and explained that I had been a captive of the old man of the sea, that I was the first who had not been strangled. Then they took me to their ship where the captain received me kindly and we set sail. And after many days and many adventures, whereby I increased my wealth, I arrived once again in Baghdad and brought unto myself this place where we sit together. Allah is good. How marvelous are your tales. Now, my friend Sinbad the porter, consider the labors which I have accomplished and the difficulties with which I have overcome. And tell me, if your estate of porter has not made for a more tranquil life than that which destiny reserved for me. As Allah is with you, my master, I no longer regret my station. For all your riches, I could not endure such as you have described. Ah, my friend, and neither shall you have to. And Sinbad the sailor ordered fine garments brought to Sinbad the porter. And when he was clothed in these, he gave him pieces of gold and appointed him to be his major domo so that the two lived together in perfect friendship and joy. Escape has brought you The Voyages of Sinbad, adapted and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring Ben Wright as Sinbad. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Ted DeCorsia, Whitfield Connor, Herb Butterfield, Parley Bear, Amanda Blake, Georgia Ellis, Larry Thor, and Kurt Martell. The music for Escape was composed by Rimsky Korsakoff and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are in command of a ship sailing with sealed orders into an ocean fraught with danger. While the enemy whom you seek is lying in wait for the moment when they will close in and strike, leaving you no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story of adventure on the high seas. <laughs> Tomorrow night, Van Heflin stars on Suspense's thrilling production, The Case of Marie Celeste, in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Van Heflin stars as a mass murderer on a ship at sea. Remember, it's tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations. Another hair-raising episode of Suspense. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you colorful mystery Tuesday nights. This is the CBS Radio Network.